We welcome to our virtual stage again, Daniel Hustel, who will talk about children in second millennium Mesopotamia and Syria from cuneiform sources. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I, uh, I think I'm doing well, the, okay, great. So uh, thank you to all of you. For me, it's an, an honor to participate in this Arwa seminars, grazie mille Armando, and vielen Dank Alexander for the, for the invitation. Uh, today I'm speaking about a topic that Armando has said uh, perfectly. Um, children in second millennium Mesopotamia and Syria from cuneiform sources. There is a rich uh, data, a rich um, archives in Mesopotamia and Syria. And I will deal with this topic in this period of time, second millennium BC, but I will also propose some parallels um, also with the, with the first millennium before Christ. So, so the, the aim of, the, of this conference, of this contribution is to explore and to underline the importance that children have for the, for the people of the ancient Near East specifically in, in Mesopotamia nowadays, Iraq and in, in Syria. The definition of childhood, uh, I will take it like very simple from the birth to the, to the adolescence, to the first marriage or to the first uh, menstruation in the case of, of girls. And the methodology that I will employ will be based in the historical approach. So epigraphy also, philology, of course. This is a topic studied in recent years, in recent decades, through many volumes, as you can see here in the screen, through uh, research funded programs or many articles. And I will try to, to resume, to do an abstract of the main lines of research and the main characteristic and features of this, uh, of this issue of childhood in the past. In his recent study, Children in Ancient Israel, Sean Flynn asked in the introductory chapter, how did ancient cultures value their children? This is the question that I want to answer through this very rich documentation of Bayard uh, genders. The geographical area taken into consideration will be Mesopotamia and Syria. And as I said before, the chronology of the sources will discur during the second millennium before Christ, but I will also take into consideration uh, some cuneiform documents of the last part of the third millennium as well as the, the first half of the first millennium BC. The type of sources are very rich also. Mythological tests, I will propose some paradigmatic lexical list, lexical series. Of course, we will study, we will underline some legal codes, not only the code of Hammurabi, as you can see here in the slide, uh, contracts of legal practice. There will be many administrative documents, especially coming from Kassite Babylonia, or even letters from the archive of Mari that will, I will propose the reading of one very significant, significant letter. The language taken into consideration in this, uh, in this seminar will be Sumerian, with a rich and varied terminology regarding children, Akkadian as well, in Ugaritic or classic Hebrew, when we'll speak sometimes about some books of the Old Testament. It is evident that ancient Mesopotamian and Syrian people, people from the ancient Near East, um, show the importance of having descendants, of having children for various reasons. One paradigmatic example that show uh, this importance is the di dialogue of uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu 
when they go down to the netherworld, Engilgamesh says, have you seen him whose ghost has no one to care for him? And Kidu answers, I have seen him. He eats what is scrapped out of cooking and crusts of bread which are thrown into the street. Gilgamesh says, he who had one son, have you seen him? And Kidu replies, I have seen him. He weeps bitterly at the nail which was driven into his wall. Gilgamesh says, he who had two sons, have you seen him? And Kidu answers, I have seen him. He sits on two brick and eats bread. After three, four, five, six children. And Gilgamesh said, he who had seven sons, have you seen him? And Enkidu answered, I have seen him as a companion of the gods. He sits on a chair, on a chair, sorry, and listens to music. This is a very significant passage and we can also find many parallels in other documents, cuneiform or not, like, this one, and I propose to read the, uh, the Psalm 127 uh, it says, children are an heritage from the Lord, offspring are reward from him, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, a children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. So this, uh, in this question, this issue is very significant, the, the fact of having descendants for various reasons, uh, as we can say now. I will deal with um, five different topics. Among them, the first one is the adoption of children. The type of adoptions in the ancient Near East I, are very varied. The first case, and I will, I will underline this, this first uh, part, uh, is adoption father-son or mother-son. So one father adopts a son. The second one can be adoption brother to brother. So one brother adopts another brother. He said, before witness, Rapanu has adopted Abimalku as a brother. This text comes from late Bronze Age Ugarit. The adoption could be a son who adopts his father. A uh, text from al Alalah in Syria says, before the king Nikmepa, Ilim Ilima has adopted Tulpure as his father. The fourth uh, case is well, when the adoption took place, the son adopts his, his mother. A document from Emmer, 13th century BC, says that Baal Gamil, son of Ikmudagan thus says, I have adopted as a mother, Naami Shada, my father's wife. The majority of these adoptions will be, as I just said, adoptions, father, son. Sorry. Yeah. There are uh, about, about adoptions in the ancient Near East. There are many studies as well. Uh, the first important study and volume was uh, the, the volume um, of, of David almost one century ago. And there are many works in general terms, or there are many studies of adoption classified by archives. So dedicated to one archive specifically. I, I have chosen three, Nippur, Nusi, or Emar. And it is important to note that the most part of the adoptions in the ancient Near East in general terms come from, uh, well, the, the adopters, the, adop the adoptees, I'm sorry, the adoptees are adults. Of course, the adopter will be always an adult, but it's maybe surprised that the adoptee normally is an adult. This is an example from the old Babylonian adoptions mainly from the archive of Nippur. We will uh, speak only, of course, about these adoptions of children, but we should take in mind that the, the, this is not the majority of documented contracts of adoptions. This, uh, there is um, uh, a typology of expressions to indicate this act of adoptions to pass of one legal sphere to another one. 
this is a fixed scheme, a fixed diagram, the preposition ana, the noun maru, so maru to in its abstract form, and the verb will be mm, very varied, leku, nadanum, etc., et generally in preterite. So the typical example is anamaruti ilki. So he took him in sonship. So we can say he adopted him. Let's, let's see one example uh, from old Babylonian times. Belet Abi and Charam Ulmash have adopted Ubar Shamash, son of Sin Idiman, from Ubar Shamash, uh, his father, and Bititum, his mother. I, I want to read every example since these uh, slides, this presentation is recording and you, you will can uh, well, uh, see on, on YouTube, okay? Because I have many examples. Let's say uh, that uh, there is a few documents on adoptions of children that give direct reference to the age of these adopted children. Give us in sonship, Shapi Kalbi, the son of Inatsili Aya, a five years child. He is our son. For example, this text. In other cases, we don't know the specific years of the child adopted, but we can know for sure that he or she is an underage person. Yasirum and Amasuen have adopted a suckling child, Ilya Willi son of Ayartum, from Ayartum, his mother, and Erishtum, her husband. Of course, a cycling child will be between one or zero, one to three years old. What happens if we don't have a direct evidence for, uh, for knowing the, the age of the adopted person? Because we have just seen that the most part of adoptions of persons, they the adopted, so the adoptee is an adult. We can differentiate two basic diagrams of adoptions. In the cold direct adoptions, personal name one adopts directly personal name two. In this case, the second one, the latter, will have enough legal capacity to arrange the contract. So in other words, the adoptee is an adult. But we have a second option, the so-called deliver in adoption contracts. In that case, the first one, PN1, personal name one, adopts another person from the third part. This third part that we can call it guardians. This is the legal tutor of the child who is recently adopted. These personal name three normally are the parents of the child, at least one of them. I propose you two examples, one of each one of them. Direct adoption from Old Babylonian Ipur says that Ipkusha, son of Dingirkuta, has adopted Hea Tajar, son of Ku, and, and delivering adoption, Yasirum and Amasuen have adopted a suckling child, the same text as we, I, I have read before. Okay, and what were the goals for adopting a child in ancient Mesopotamia and Syria? For uh, modern societies, Goody said that the, the the reasons and goals and objectives for adopting a child. The first one could be supply with households to orphans, bastards, exposed children, or sons of problematic couples. Or supply with descendants to couples without children. Or thirdly, supply to a person of, or couple with a person able to inherit a property. In the case of the ancient Near East, at least the documents from the second millennium BC, it saw a very, very varied uh, casuistic and reasons and goals for adopting a child. I will, I will uh, propose you a list of goals and objectives always being based in specific documents. 
The first, maybe the most important one, is having a hair from the part of the adopter and inheriting from the part of the adoptee. Uh, an old Babylonian um, text from Ur says that regarding a child called Simbel Apli, son of Ingur Sin and Dagatum, Ibashi Ilum and his wife, Ningal Rimera, have adopted him from Ingur Sin and Dagatum, and they have established him as their heir. There always or almost always are a clause regarding this last part, so the right to inherit. This text is from the first millennium BC and says that Ashur Matitakin and Manuki don't have any child, so he has adopted La Ashur. Even if Ashur Matutakin and Manuki should have seven children, La Ashur will be the firstborn. We have many, many parallels on the preference of mm, a recently adopted child or the preference mm, uh, regarding a uh, possible and future offspring uh, biologically, uh, bi biological. Another objective is having an apprentice or training in a craft. A document from Nusi from the 15th uh, uh, century BC says that Hui Tila, son of Barteya, has delivered in adoption his son Naniya to Tiwaya, slave of Enamati. And Tiwaya will supply Naniya with a wife and he will teach him the trade of weaver. This document, as I said before, from the 15th century before Christ, reminds us uh, uh, the, a passage or actually two clauses, two passages, articles from the Code of Hammurabi that says, if a master craftsman adopts a child to rear him and he teaches him his craft, the child will not be reclaimed. On the other hand, if he does not teach him his craft, this child could go back to his father's house. Another goal is rearing a child. The Code of Eshnuna says that if a man gives his son to be breastfed and reared, but he does not provide the feast of food, oil, and dressing for a period of three years, then he will pay 10 shekels of silver as the rearing of his son and he could take back his son with him. And specific examples, in this case, from the first millennium BC, from neo Babylonian times, says that regarding a three months boy, son of Idin Nabu, from the family of Mudami Kadat, Idin Nabu has given him to the woman Amat Lil, and she will breastfeed him. Other reasons for adopting a child is the possible inability of a father and or a mother. The archive of Emar says in one text from the archive of Emar, Kue, daughter of, it's lost the name, that says, my husband is an old man, but our children are still young and there's nobody to support them. So in that case, the scribe or the, the, the people are um, justifying the act of adoption, the cause of adoption. Well said. Um, two realities that are usually very linked are two ideas, abandonment of children and the posterior, the subsequent adoption. The loss of Lipit Ishtar from the old Babylonian period said that if a man rescues a child from a well, he shall take his foot and seal a tablet with his feet size as identification. We, we, we have some specific concrete examples of this identification as we see later in the archive of Emar. The Neo-Babylonian text uh, MBK 439 states that these are the witnesses before whom Tziraya, a single woman, has thrown her son to a duck and Nur Shamash has rescued him, literally has risen him, from the, gods, from the dog's mouth and she'll rear him. 
Of course, there, there are religious reasons for adopting a child, normally a, a, a girl. And the old Babylonian text from Larsa says, um, salute to the wife of Kanana, has adopted a Wirtu, daughter of Hupatu, from Upatu, her father, and Rubatu. A Wirtu will be Harintu, so sacred prostitute, and Shalurtu, her adoptive mother, will be in charge of her support. I will finally deal with this cause, the maintenance of the parents in the future. In Kasai Nippur, there is a text that says that Rabashani Nima will provide to Kidin Shumaliya and Agar Garutu with food. So this is specifically noted. As I've just said, the adoption sort of children are usually are normally linked to um, abandonment of children or better, on the contrary, the abandonment of children are linked to adoptions of children. Let's say, let's see some uh, examples of abandonments of children in second millennium Mesopotamia and Syria. Of course, we, we know, we do know by heart many stories about uh, children that were thrown into a river and after rescued by someone, of course, Romulus and Remus, Oedipus, Perseus, Habis, king, mythical king of Tartessus in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, regarding the, the ancient Near Eastern area, we find the legend of Sargon, who said, my mother high priestess conceived me and gave birth to me in secret. She placed me in a reed basket and she closed its hole with pit. She put me in the river, which did not race against me. The river carried me to Aki, the water power. Aki, the water power, took me out when he was sinking his bucket into the river. Aki, the water power, adopted me as his son, and he rose me. Same thing, I'm, going, I'm not going to read every uh, parallel of Moses, but the last part says that when the child grew up, the daughter of the Pharaoh took him and she took him as his son. So she adopted him and she gave him the name of Moses. We have many examples like uh, Cyrus the Great also, uh, but uh, we, will, we will deal right now with specific examples. Firstly, we, we, must, we, we should mention the Mesopotamian lexical series, this series, this list, written in Sumerian and Akkadian, uh, like Hara, Hubulu, or Ana Itishu. Um, pass some passages of the Siri Ana Itishu of the last part of the third millennium or first part of the second millennium BC states these expressions, these formulas. Hmm? He has rescued him from the mouth of the dog. He has been found in a well he has taken from the street. We will see until what point this will be physical abandonments or were merely legal rejections of the child. The Akkadian terminology regarding abandonments is very, very rich. There are many verbs used for the act of abandonment, like nasaku, Nadu, Efebu, Tsalau, to throw, to leave, even to abort. And on the contrary, so in the second step of the contracts, the first part is the abandonment, where the child uh, needs a, a rescuer, a, a, sa a savior. The second verse uh, entails the act of the adoption. So, Nashu, to take care. Shaku to rise, leku to take, rabu to rear. I like the last, the last one, lamadu to recognize, to recognize a child because he he was uh, condemned to die if <laughs> without my help. There are some uh, codes, legal codes, that speak about uh, abandonments of children, like the very famous. Article 185 of the Code of Hammurabi, Suma William Tsehra Minameshu, 
Ana Maruti Milke, Il Kema, Urtabishu Tarbitunsi, Ul Ibakar. If a man adopts a child in a meshu and he rears him, this child will not be reclaimed. This expression in a meshu has been historiographically controversial. Some authors thought that it was in his name, but uh, I think there is a, a scientific consent, consent that uh, in it, uh, the, this expression in a mesu means in his waters, in his water, in a direct um, uh, evidence uh, regarding the amniotic fluid, of course. So right after the birth. This expression in a meshu, so in his waters, or in a meshu, uda meshu, so in his waters and in, in his blood, is common in some contracts of adoptions of, of abandonments of children. The old Babylonian, so the, well, the, the text from Elam, this text from Elam says that she has abandoned him in his waters and in his blood, and she has delivered him to Tusi Damkat, the wet nurse. This passage reminds us to a passage of Ezekiel when speaking about the, the Israel infidelity, um, personified in a just born girl who is a symbol of the city of Jerusalem. And after explaining the abandonment of this girl, so Jer Jerusalem, God rescues her by saying, but I passed next to you and I saw you rolled about your blood. And I said to you, live in your blood. Thus I said to you, live and grow up in your blood. Hmm? So water and blood. This is um, an exceptional case, an exceptional document from old Babylonian Ipur. Uh, it was, uh, was published um, less than 20 years ago. And uh, this is um, a typical exercise of scribe that has to um, know by heart every formula, every expression regarding different issues, different topics. And in this paragraph that I'm gonna show you now, um, the scribe is writing something about a boy, an abandoned boy. Of course, it's fictitious, it's not real. Regarding a suckling boy found in a well, rescued from the dog's mouth, without father, without mother, without sister, without brother, and without foster brother, Ishtarinti Li adopted him as his son, and he gave him the name of Ilituram, poor boy. Of course, it, it is not real, it's a uh, scribble exercise. And sure, we have many, many contracts related to abandonments of infants. And after with the subsequent adoption. This is a neo Babylonian document that says that the woman Tirai has thrown her baby to the dog's mouth and no Shamas have saved him. We have just read other neo Babylonian documents. They read the, they read the contract concerning Shepitaya, the one that Tirai took from the street and adopted her, whose feet she has imprinted in clay. This act of imprint in clay. We know this act, we know this in identification of children through their feet uh, in real and specific cases in the ancient Near East. We have, uh, we have read the Code of Liberty Star and there is a um, uh, 13th uh, century text before Christ of, from the Syrian archive of Emar that states uh, very, mm, uh, a very interesting case in which Tadama, son of Karbu, man of the city of Satapa, and Kue, his wife, they voluntarily sold their two sons and two daughters, Baal Abiyya, Baal Belu, Ishmadagan, and Baal Aumi, the latter a breastfeeding baby, being 60 shekels of silver, their total price in status of slavery. I don't mention now a previous text in which the first 
a girl, so um, uh, Baala Bia was, um, was given in adoption. Mm -hmm. So after Tadama, their father, and Kue, their mother, have placed their feet, so of the children, on clay. You see, two of the three preserved imprints of, of feet in clay with the names of the sold children and the seal and every information. It was found in the archive of Emmer, right close to the contract of sale of four children. Finally, I will deal with one very uh, significant uh, text of abandonment of children with a not very happy end. This actually is a case of infanticide that we find in the archive of Mari. I think uh, this is very impressive. Say to my Lord, that says Bachli Dlin, your servant, a suckling baby born last year, lighting from the ancient palace, which is close to the lower region next to the canal. This child had been cut in half. There only remained rest from the breast to the head, but not the head, and nothing remained down to the feet. Boy or girl who can know it, from the chest to the lowest part of the body, nothing remained. The same day I was aware of this story. I gave the convenient orders and I insistently asked the leaders of the neighborhood, the master of the artisans and the foreigners, but neither the person in charge of the baby, nor the father, nor the mother, nor anybody who was up to date on the matter turned up before me. I think uh, there is no, there are no comments for for treating this letter very strong. Uh, but one important thing, one important idea, is that the the child, the boy or the girl, is uh, in in any case important, and they are uh, well, they are insistently asked the leaders of the neighborhood. There is. Uh, well, you, you can see every information here in this letter. As some conclusion on this part on abandonments of children, of course, we may assume that the, the most part, the majority of real cases were not registered. That uh, will happen also with specific um, uh, issues like the abortion practice. We can say that the expressions for the abandonment have the sense of legal rejection and repudiation. But of course, the, the maybe in origin there was something physical, but the expression are very, very stipulated, are very fixed. And of course, we find abandonments in context of economic crisis and difficulties of family, family difficulties or family crisis, not only in a uh, state uh, crisis. The next question, the next matter that I will deal with is child slavery. We have much information about this topic, so I will try to organize in a, in a good way. Mendelssohn, in his ancient book, Slavery in the Ancient Near East, said that the main sources for the study of child slavery were, or, or slavery in general, were prisoners of war, foreign slaves, abandonment and kidnapping of children, sales of children, self-sale, and being insolvent. These uh, six ideas are valid for slavery in general. And what about for child slavery? What are the sources for the study of child slavery? We, um, we should take into account the main terminology. And there is a general difficulty when differentiating the concept of child and slave. It happens in many, in many languages, in many cultures. I propose you a couple of them. In Greek, the concept pies or mankipus, the Latin mankipus can refer both to child and slave. And also 
uh, also happens with Sumerian, Akkadian, and even Hebrew languages. The main sources for the study of child slavery is, uh, are the sources that I show you here in the screen, food ration, ration, sales of children, forced labor, deportation, kidnapping, abandonments of children we have treated already, debt, slavery, or slavery from birth. Let's speak about food rations. The food rations, um, normally monthly allocation, they are generally assigned to families in the whole, and there is in U3 or Middle Babylonian documents, there is a specific quantity of food rations for each worker, or in Middle Assyrian documentation, we find specific quantity for each family, not divided by individuals. Normally, these food rations are in barley, oil, or wool. Uh, occasionally, we find these food rations in beer, meat, or even in money instead of food. I show you this middle Kassite example, middle Babylonian examples, the first part of the, of the tablet, the, the left part. Uh, in, in this part appears the quantity of rations. In the second, in this column colored in green, we, um, we find the, the, um, the age of each worker. And finally, the name and or activity of each worker. This text comes from uh, Harbet del Tuera from Middle Assyrian period. And we, we find also an age divisions hmm, for uh, these workers, Talmetu, apprentice, child, wind, ba boy, suckling baby, etc. I propose you uh, a, a chart, a comparative chart with uh, the rations of year three and the middle Babylonian period in mainly the archive from the archive of Nippur in Ku. You can see in the slide. And one of the most uh, important sources for study the child slavery are the sales of children. Uh, they are very frequent. The sales of people in Kassite documents from Nippur, where the sold people are divided in sex and age, hmm, into sex and age. You can see in the slide this information. And there are two types of children, sales of children. First, the individual sales. So only one child is sold. And this is the basic scheme, the basic diagram, the basic parts of the contracts of selling, of selling uh, one child in Kassite Babylonia. Of course, I will not read everything, but this is an example from Middle Babylonian Ur. And it follows, it follows this, uh, this diagram, this order. The second type of, all, uh, of Middle Babylonian times of sales of children are cases in which children are sold within their families. So this in a, there is a, a group, uh, a group of sold people, the family, always the head of the family, be the father of them or the mother will be in first place. And afterwards, the children will be quoted. One example from Kassite Nippur are these texts in which you see in the translation below that one woman who is the head of the family is, is sold after a girl, who is actually the daughter of the first one, of the first woman, one boy and one adolescent. And all of them, so four slaves are sold in this, uh, in this contract. We have many examples of, of children 
uh, sold within their families or families sold together. Let's see an example, example, or here in a joint of two gurus, two, so two adolescents, five adolescents, female adolescents, two girls, three uh, suckling boys, and one suckling girl sold here in this contract. Apart from these types of sales of children with a very fixed and canonical order, we find, especially in the Syrian area, we find other uh, sales of children with no canonical order. We can uh, remember this text that I read before, the um, Sadama who, and his wife, who both of them, they sold, they, they sold uh, their four children and they imprint the feet of clay. He is the contract of sailing. And I remind these three, um, there are three preserved imprint of feet. And a very important issue to, to analyze, to deep into the reality of child slavery is the forced labor. Uh, the forced labor performed and carried out by children. I will deal specifically with this, uh, this Kassite um, archive of Nippur, especially in the 14th and 13th century before Christ. Uh, we know this reality thanks to uh, very common administrative rosters. They are abundant in Kasai documentation, as I said. And these workers are classified by families, sex, age, and caste uh, and tasks carried out. So this is in, the, in that case, there is a direct evidence between the uh, the, the age and the people who work. So we generally can assign a specific age range to the workers. The distribution is the same as in the sales of people. So the distribution regarding the, the age of, the, of these forced labors. And we may find many children uh, within one only document or one uh, up to uh, 18, for example, in, in, in the information that I propose to you. Not every uh, document on, on this topic has been already published. Well, this is divided from adolescence to in the right part to uh, suckling babies. So in the right part, the suckling babies. And I show you one example of roster of forced labors. In this case, coming from Nippur, in the left part, there is the, the information between, uh, uh, about the, um, the age of each worker. Mm -hmm. So I only underline the workers that are under age. So three male adolescents, one uh, suckling boy, one, I'm sorry, two suckling girls. In these forced labors, uh, we are informed also about the physical conditions of the workers, not only the children, of course, <clears throat> the adults and the old people and the adolescents, the suckling babies, etc. We have reference to ill people, blind, not blind, I'm sorry, or deaf, or people who is uh, on the road. So who has, in theory, permission to go out of this uh, uh, servile sphere, or maybe when they have escaped. The included tasks performed by people, and I remind you, I'm not now, only talking about children, a farmer, gardener, cooker, butcher, brewer, road sweeper, builder, carpenter, and there are many other tasks. 
Special important and significative uh, are the tax re related to the weaver uh, because there are many, many specific tasks like fuller or other that we, we don't have yet a translation. Ashkapu, katsiru, kunsiru, hupu, etc. And what were the tasks performed by children? These are the activities that children carried out in this context of servile laborers, building laborers, labor building roads, artisans, cookers, brewers, butchers, gardeners, potters, engravers, cattle, horse cattle raisers, shepherds. And we also have two cases of scribes in this context of servile population. And of course, both of them as uh, they, they are labeled with the, um, the age of adolescents, both uh, male adolescents. Children, like in, uh, unfortunately nowadays in many countries, children are normally linked to textile works. We find this kind of, uh, of activities performed by children in that cases related to textile works. And you can see here this, this diagram, uh, the people with sex activity information recorder, the majority of them, they are adults, but we, 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 we find one fourth uh, of, of children. And this is interesting to note that one fifth of children who has information about the activity, the tax perform, are suckling child, suckling children. What was possible? A suckling children is a children who is uh, in, in terms of, of time between the, the age range uh, covers a period of three, even four years from the birth to three or four years old. So we do have information of these activities performed by suckling children. Which information? Well, I, I firstly propose this uh, example, specific example, in which these, uh, these three underage people are linked to one specific task. But let's go back to the suckling babies and their respective works, and always being based in these forced laborers uh, rosters of the archive of Nippur. Mm, these are the cases. So in number of suckling children for whom we have the information of their activities. We do find engravers, horse, scatter, riser, potters, artisans, or cookers. And it's very interesting that suckling male, male suckling boy, uh, male suckling children, or female suckling children, many of them are attached, are linked to these textile labors. Mm -hmm. With two, three years old, they are capable of contributing. Uh, in, this, in these activities. The last uh, source taken into consideration here in, in, my, in my conference about, um, uh, about child slavery are deportations. I show you here a diagram of one one single text of the Middle Assyrian period coming from Asur. And these are the deported people. And you see here that there are many children, when children or even suckling children who are deported in this of uh, 13th century before Christ. There's a in, very interesting group of texts, a lot of texts of Mari, uh, 18th century BC, that we find around 1,500 deportees and the percentage of children among the deportees at 
And within the deported children, the percentage of suckling children are 25%. So it's, it's very significant. I finally propose you a, te a text of uh, coming from Ugarit about deportation and the context, the historical context is, uh, is, is this one, the Hittite conquest of Cyprus with the help of the king of Ugarit and the Hittite king rewards the Ugaritic help by sending them Cypriot prisoners of war. And all the deportees are women and children. Okay, Cyprus and here Ugarit. And in this geographical context, we find this, uh, this situation. And of course, the text is from Rashamra, from Ugarit. This is the text. And this is the translation. So every line who is underlined in these lines, uh, at least one child appears. Mm -hmm. So always woman and children. Now, th there is no only one single man here in this long list. And there are all of them from Alasia, so from Cyprus, Cyprus. Okay, the last um, issue that I want to deal with is abortion. Um, as I say before, abortion was a uh, practice in the ancient Near East. We have many references condemning normally uh, the adoptions. Now, of course, the Hebrew Bible says that even before the birth, the, the, the child, the boy or the girl was, was alive. Was, and the Psalm 22 says that, that from birth I was cast on you, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. The CAD, the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, mm, well, uh, speaks about in, uh, about plants in order that a pregnant woman not have a miscarriage. There are another methods to have a voluntary miscarriage. So mixing uh, seven plants and drinking uh, drinking wine, etc. So ancient Mesopotamian people, of course, they did know they did know how to abort voluntary. Uh, the, the fetus. Sally Crawford says that if the aim was to destroy the life of an unwanted child, infanticide offered a far safer and more certain remedy than abortion. But in any case, I, I do agree with this statement of Sally Crawford. In any case, we do find cases of abortion or uh, cases of theoretical uh, abortions. The laws of liberty star, they quote that if a man strikes the daughter of a man and causes her to lose her fetus, he shall wait and deliver 30 shekels of silver. If she dies, that male shall be killed. If a man strikes a slave woman, so there's a, a crucial difference of a man and he causes her to lose her fetus, he shall wait and deliver five shekels of silver. In these cases, in these hypothetical cases, the abortion was not performed voluntarily by the mother herself. And we do find only one text from Mesopotamia uh, that deals with this question. So a voluntary abortion by the mother. And this is a, a legislative uh, text coming from the middle Assyrian laws, the law 53, if a woman aborts her fetus but her own action and then and they then prove the charges against her and find her guilty, they shall impale her, they shall not bury her. If she dies as a result of aborting her fetus, they shall impale her, they shall not bury her. If any person should hide that woman because she aborted her fetus, and unfortunately, the rest of the document, the, the, the rest of the, the article of the text is lost. It is very significant, this, uh, this article of the Middle Assyrian laws, since um, in, in, in general terms, the child, or maybe it's my interpretation, the child does not belong 
to, uh, to her mother herself, but also with uh, he or she belongs to the society in general. He or she is a, is a valuable good for the rest of society. So concluding, um, I, I want to underline, uh, as I show through many paradigmatic examples, the importance of children for ancient Near Eastern society. I think that is evident. Uh, it's evident as well that children, they were a basic economic driving force. And of course, not only in a servile context, as we saw when treating the Kasai Nippur. And there's a kind of legal attention towards children because children are important, are important for Mesopotamian, for ancient Syrian people. And I maybe would question marks, but because this legal protection is a, a, a common expression for nowadays world, but it didn't exist in ancient world, but it's a kind of legal protection of minors. Um, and this is the idea that uh, I, I see not always hidden, so sometimes explicitly in this text that I have shown you today. So uh, maybe we can reflect or, uh, on, on the conception of child from the womb as the Middle Assyrian law 53 shows or, uh, yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have some doubts and I, we have no time now for answering, please note my email address and I will be happy to, to answer you. Thank you so much.